and they sent us off to Italy. And that's where I joined my eventual four squadron in seven wing, South African Air Force, uh, which was up at near Rimini on the Adriatic coast of Italy at that stage. I joined them there. Anyway, saw the whole of that winter through. It was a terrible winter in Italy, that end of 1944 winter. Uh, but come early 1945, then we resumed getting really stuck in, mostly dive bombing. At that stage, uh, there was the, the German air power there was virtually nil, so there was nothing really to worry about there. So they converted the Spitfires into Spitty bombers. And uh, we used to go out and various ways of doing it. The, the army used to ask us to go and fix something that was in their way on the ground. They called that cab rank and so on. And, um, and, and the thing hotted up. As the weather got better, the thing hotted up. February 1945, we moved from our winter quarters, which were at Forley in a house, to the beach again on the coast at Ravenna. Now, Ravenna, of course, is where I did most of my operational work. Um, and about my, I don't know, 40th or so operation, where four of us had to go and bomb a railway line, um, try and break it so that the Germans couldn't move stuff around, you know, in preparation for the land, the land battles. Um, four of us went. Uh, I managed to drop quite a decent bomb that time. It hit a culvert on the road. We, our job was to break the railway line. Mine fell right on a culvert and blew it in, out of existence, so the line was bead. Um, and then two of us, my, my number one and me behind him, went down looking for, on the way home again now, on the way back to Ravenna, looking for any transport or anything else moving on the German side. Who was your number one then? Number one was a chap Bill Tatham, okay. known as Little Tat because his elder cousin was also in the wing. Little Tat and I. So anyway, we went down. We saw a cloud of dust on the road. There was obviously some vehicle batting it off. So down we went to shoot this thing up if it looked. But as soon as we got somewhere near it, we saw it had red crosses on the side. So we had to assume it was an ambulance. We had to leave it alone. So the two of us immediately started climbing up to to join the other two who were waiting for us up top. <coughs> and my engine started giving trouble. Got rough, started missing, uh, white smoke coming out of it. It was, it was sounding very dicky. And so I tried to get a bit of height and got up to, I reckon, about 2,000 feet or just over. And then the engine cut altogether. So then my little story begins because I had to get out quickly. We had made up our minds that whenever possible we would rather jump out of a Spitfire and use our parachutes, bail out, rather than try and land them. Because so many blokes had killed themselves trying to land, crash land these things, force land them. So I managed just to get everything prepared for this bailout, which included making sure that your attachments to the Spitfire were no longer there, your radio one, your, your straps, that your, your, your harness has strapped you in. Um, you had to make sure this little canopy above your head was now out of the way, and eventually <clears throat> turn this and, and, and trim trim the, the plane forward so that if you left the joystick, your nose would go down. But now, at the last minute, when everything was ready, you turned the Spitfire on its back, let the thing go, and of course, instead of the nose going down, the nose goes up and shoots you down, head first, out of it. So, just made it 
just made it, just landed on a farm road on my face, kaboom. Um, my number one, Bill Tatham, he then flew away because he didn't want to you know, circle me and show them exactly where I was. And uh, first thought was to try and get away. We were almost in sight of, of our own aerodrome, except that there was a few miles of enemy country still in between us. So I thought, well, I'd, I'd try and hide away. So I ran as fast as I could down this road, looking for somewhere to hide. It wasn't much, it was just a flat bit of country there. And I saw a, a couple of farmers, they were watching me coming down asked them, you know, if there were any Germans around. They didn't say a thing, they just looked at me. So I realized they were not going to help me. So I went on and eventually <clears throat> I had to hide in something and there was a, what I took to be a haystack was, was probably more like a, a pile of, of mealy stalks or something. But it was quite a nice place to butter in and, you know, just sit in there. You, you couldn't be seen from outside. Anyway, little I was a bit naive because it didn't take long for the, the Germans when they arrived at the scene to uh, ask, presumably they asked these Italians where I was and I presume they pointed to the haystack or the whatever it was. And so the next thing these Germans were outside chattering away, the next thing I heard some pistols, so their Lugers, I think they were taking pot shots, they knew I was in there. They'd been told by these ites that I was in there, taking pot shots. So eventually I thought, well, I, it's time to give up. So I came out, camarade, and taken prisoner of war. So that was the end of the, the really exciting part. Then it, then it was just interesting from then on.